On the Build Show today, we're going to be answering the question, do houses need to breathe? You know, I get this comment all the time because we talk a lot about air tightness on this channel. I get the comment also, Matt, houses that were older, they lasted because they breathed, because they were leaky. You're building houses way too tight. On today's episode, we're going to answer this question. Let's get going. Houses need to breathe. We hear this comment all the time out there in the building world. And certainly if you watch my comments, it gets said all the time. This is a pretty generic saying, but in reality, the concern is a good concern. People are saying, look, we need fresh air in our houses. We don't want to get hurt because of indoor air quality. And so the idea is, Matt, let's make a leakier house so that we can ensure that the people inside are going to have plenty of fresh air. Let's break this down a little bit. Where does this myth come from? Well, number one, old houses, certainly they did last because of leakiness. Here's an example of a house. This was originally built in the 1930s. This is one that my company remodeled a few years ago. And if you look at that old construction, this house was in great shape almost, what, 80 years later when we remodeled it. And here's why. Look at the walls on this house. This house was built with traditional framing, two by four, two inch by four inch studs with shiplap sheathing on the inside and the outside. This isn't Chip and Joanna shiplap that was put over drywall. This is the real deal. This is structural shiplap, one by six pine, all solid, no man-made materials. And look at this interesting photo that I found. The homeowners actually found this in the attic. This was probably taken around the 70s or 80s. Look at the wallpaper. When the house was originally built, they wallpapered right over top of the shiplap. And look right here underneath the windows. Obviously, a ton of leakiness on this house from water and certainly from air. But when I remodeled it all these decades later, I found no problems. We really found no rot on the wood. We found no mold on the back of the sheetrock that was probably added in the 80s or 90s. Pretty incredible. However, think about whether this house would meet modern standards. Certainly, it wouldn't meet code. Certainly, it would be an energy pig and it would use lots of electricity to cool or heat this house. And I can't imagine this house was super comfortable, but all that being said, very, very durable house, lasted for generations with no problems. Okay, now let's fast forward a little bit and let's look at new houses. Now new houses today, if they were to utilize a similar strategy for fresh air, they would have three problems. Number one, they wouldn't meet code. You know, codes have now changed so that starting in 2009, any house built since then has to actually have a blower door test and needs to meet an air tightness standard. Depending on where you are in the U.S. watching this, your air standard is probably somewhere between 3 ACH50 and 5. That's a blower door measurement of how leaky the house is. If we pressurize the house with a blower door, check out my other videos on how this works, but basically we replace the front door with a fan, we pressurize the house as if we're blowing air into a balloon, and then with that fan calibrated and a pressure gauge, we can figure out how much pressure there is differentially between the inside and the outside. The fan ramps up so there's actually 50 pascals of pressure. That's roughly equivalent to about a 15, 16 mile an hour wind pushing against the side of the house. And then it's gonna force air through the walls and we can actually gauge how much air by using this calibrated fan. Now, if we were gonna uh, meet the standard of five ACH50, which I have to here in the south, that means with that fan calibrated, roughly a 16 mile an hour wind acting, the amount of air volume the house has would be exchanged five times in one hour. That's pretty leaky, but that's current code and that's way tighter than old houses. If you're in the north, your standard is gonna be three ACH50. That means that there's basically an open hole about mm, yay big or so if you were to add up all those small little leaks in the house. Now, what's the problem with this on today's houses? Now, number one, we have to get code, of course, right? Number two, we're gonna waste a lot of energy by having an air leaky house. I've seen a stat that says between 25 and 40% of a house's heating cost is from air leakiness. How does this work? Let's think about this in the north. If you're in the north and it's cold in the winter time, your house is heated, that hot air is gonna rise and they call this the stack effect, which means that your house at the top of the house, the ceilings at the top of your house, are gonna actually have a pressure of differential between the inside and the outside, which is gonna to wanna to force air through that. That hot air is gonna to wanna to rise. And where does that happen? It happens around electrical outlets, around uh, drilled holes in your top plates, 
around your recessed cans, your light fixtures, anything that penetrates that air barrier on your ceiling, which is typically your drywall ceiling. And then when that air leaks out, what happens? Your house is under a vacuum and air leaks back in, and usually that's uh, at the cold lower location. So now you're leaking in cold air into your basement, around your bottom plates, through your rim joists, all those places. And remember, the other thing that's happening is as we leak that warm air out of our envelope in the wintertime, that warm air probably has some moisture in it because your house in the wintertime, you're cooking, you're bathing, you're boiling water. You've got all these moisture sources in your house, so you've got some humidity in that air, some moisture in that air. And as it leaks out, it very well could hit a cold surface like the back of your sheathing, for instance. And if that happens, what's going to happen? That cold air, or pardon me, that warm, moist air as it leaks out is going to hit a cold condensing surface. And that's how we see a lot of mold growth in northern houses. And that's also sometimes how you can get rot in a northern house. And remember, houses today are not built like they were in the 1930s. They're built with much more moisture sensitive materials. Remember, going back to that example, it wasn't until the 80s or 90s that drywall was added to that house. Other than that, the entire house was solid lumber. There was no man-made products in there. There was no OSB sheathing. There was no MDF. None of those materials were present. So that wood could actually soak up a little bit of water. They actually call that a hygric buffer capacity. That's a geeky term to mean that house can hold a lot of water before there's a problem. Newer houses, newer materials, man-made engineered woods, much less buffer capacity. We can hold just a little bit of water. And let's think about what happens in the south. It's often hot and humid outside, and inside, at least nine months of the year, my air conditioner is going. So if my house is kept at 75 or 72 degrees, let's say, with the air conditioner, that warm, moist air leaks in through a wall cavity, let's say around an electrical outlet, what's going to happen? It's going to also find a cold condensing surface. And when I remodel, I find lots of nasty stuff that happens through this. I see, number one, uh, a lot of pink fiberglass insulation that's stained dark. It's actually acting as a filter. A lot of air has leaked through there, and it's deposited dirt and other outside allergens and pollens in that um, kind of filter, which is that insulation. The other thing that's going to happen is you're going to see a lot of mold growth on all kinds of backs of surfaces. Here's a picture of a house that I remodeled that had a crawl space, and look at all the mold growth on the sheetrock at the bottom plate. Air was leaking up through that bottom plate. It was hitting that cold condensing surface because the drywall was cold, and the back of the drywall, which is paper-faced, was a great spot for that mold to grow. Here's another picture of a house that had mold growing on the back of the vapor barrier. This is another place that can grow mold because condensation can happen there. Okay, so we talked about codes not allowing air leakage anymore. We talked about how uh, air leakage is going to lead to really expensive bills. We talked about houses today that are made of more moisture sensitive materials, so we have to be cautious. The fourth piece of the puzzle for air leakage is just plain old comfort. You know, if you think about those 70s or 80s cars that we remember fondly, and when you start to get to be in your 40s like me, you wish you could buy back your high school car. That Buick Riviera I drove in the 70s, super fun car, it had a velour interior. But would it meet today's standards for comfort? No way. Forget about energy efficiency. It was not a very comfortable car. If I were to drive that in Texas in the heat, super uncomfortable. I had a lot of air leaking. It was not nearly as quiet as today's cars. Totally different vehicle, totally different standards. So today's buyers have a much more narrow band of comfort, and those air leaks are not tolerated. So we've got lots of reasons why we can't build leaky anymore. And the last reason why we don't want to build leaky anymore is we want to bring fresh air in on our terms. We want to filter it and we want to bring it in at a known location and at a known rate. We can't just rely on the wind blowing for bringing that fresh air in. So if we pile all this, what's the bottom line here? Guys, we cannot build leaky anymore. We do not want leaky houses. We want very, very tight houses. In fact, I would tell you, you almost cannot build your house tight enough. Let me give you a couple of examples. Uh, a friend of mine, Stephen Basic, an architect that you saw in the passive house build that we did on the last episode, has a great example I've heard him use. Steve says, think about your house like a body. You know, your body has the same structure like a house. You've got bones to support that. You've got a bunch of openings, your ears, your eyes, your nose, in your body, but everything is airtight in your body because your body has this right here. It has a fresh air system. It's bringing air through one location, a known location, it's filtering it with your lungs, and then it's distributing that oxygen where it needs to go. 
Another great example by Armando Cabo, another architect friend of mine. He loves to say a house is very much like either a submarine or an airplane. Think about those two vehicles that we've engineered. A modern airplane, a modern submarine, very, very airtight. And we send our Navy boys under the sea for a month at a time. How do we do that? We have to make it tight. We have to build tight, but we also have to ventilate right. So this is the turning point in the video now. Hopefully I've made the case for why we need to build tight, but let's talk about what needs to happen when we build tight. I think a lot of this issue of houses need to breathe revolves around people that maybe were around in the 70s when we were building super insulated and super airtight houses, but we weren't thinking about the house as a system. If we think about the house as a system, then we realize, okay, build tight, but we need to ventilate correctly. We need to bring fresh air in, we need to mechanically ventilate it, and we need to do that on our terms so we can filter it. You know, my car does this, right? If you ever stop your car, how long does it take for you sitting in the driver's seat with your engine off before you're uncomfortable in the car? Not very long, typically. You're gonna wanna roll down those windows and bring some fresh air in. But if my engine is running, I'm bringing fresh air from, in, from the outside. It has an in-cabin filter that's gonna filter out all the pollens, all the mold spores, all those other nasty things that are outside. And the air inside my car can feel very fresh and very comfortable. I can sit there for a long time as long as the engine's going. And I can cruise down the highway at 70 miles an hour and have a conversation with my wife in the seat next to me. We're very comfortable because the car is thought of as a system, because we were introducing mechanical fresh air. And that was missing on those 70s houses that were super insulated and super airtight. They had moisture buildup. They had a lot of problems because of that moisture. They weren't bringing that filtered fresh air in on a regular basis. And so I think this air tightness strategy got a little bit of a black eye from those 70s American houses. In today's building world, we know how to do this. We can design a house that's super airtight, that has a smart filtration system that's gonna do something like this. It's gonna bring that fresh air in. It's gonna send it through a giant filter, just like my car's in-cabin filter. We can drop all the nasty stuff from the outside. We can bring it in on a fresh air system that's got a timer on there. We can bring it on a known quantity. And that means then that we want to build as tight as possible because we're bringing in that mechanical fresh air. You've seen me on my videos use a lot of products like this. This is a peel and stick house wrap that I've used on a lot of houses. Um, we've used fluid applied products. We've talked about the Huber Zip system. These are all systems that are dealing, number one, with water, because that's going to kill a house first, but number two, are dealing with air. We need to control the water, and we need to gain control of the air. If we let that air filter in whenever the wind is blowing, we're never going to take control of that indoor environment. We want to build as airtight as possible, and then we want to bring fresh air in on our terms. Guys, I used a bunch of uh, smart people and a, sm a bunch of smart resources. I'm going to link to some of these papers uh, in the description below. This is some Allison Bales blogs I was reading. This is from Green Building Advisor. Uh, Alex Wilson wrote a great article. I've got a great John Straub article for you here. So if you want to read up on this, I'm not the only building science expert that advocates for build tight, ventilate right. There's some great people out there that have lots of good information. We're going to get into some more specifics in the future about how to build tight and how to ventilate right, so stay tuned for that. I also wanted to mention, if any of you are gonna be in the Northeast, I'm gonna be in Baltimore for the Remodeling and Deck Expo. These guys just sent me a reminder card in the mail today, so I thought I'd use this as a prop. October uh, 9th, 10th, and 11th, I'll be there Wednesday and Thursday next month in October. We're actually gonna have a happy hour for the build show on Wednesday night, stay tuned for some details on that. I'm gonna be giving a seminar on Wednesday. We're gonna have an actual booth for the build show. We're gonna be shooting a bunch of videos there. Jordan Smith is gonna join me and we're gonna be doing some live tool demos as well. We're gonna be talking about how to set up a job site trim shop with our friends at Bosch. We're gonna be talking about using Festool track saws on the job site. And we're gonna be talking about DeWalt multi-tools and how a remodeler can put those to good use in all kinds of different projects. You can get a free pass with this code, with build, at the link in the description below. Guys, thanks for joining me. Big topic today. Thanks for sticking around for a long video. Hope you have a great weekend. Follow me on Twitter or Instagram. We'll see you next time on The Build Show.